Good morning, everybody. Hello. Welcome to our Facebook live stream on Gemini and its ruling planet Mercury and the associated house, the third house. Wishing you all a beautiful morning, day or evening, wherever you happen to be. So let's talk about Gemini. Now, the interesting thing about astrodharma or astrology in general is that we all have all of the signs and all of the planets and all of the houses in our chart. So we may not particularly identify with a certain sign or planet or house. Maybe we don't have anything happening in that area of our chart, but nonetheless, it does affect us and, and perhaps more subtly if we don't relate with it that strongly. So Gemini is about communication and information. And so this is a good time to be looking at this. Uh, what do I have in Gemini in my chart? What do I have in the third house? And where is the planet Mercury in my chart? And this will give us little pieces of information that will help us understand how those energies work in our lives. And we can either help tone them down if they're a bit over the top, or we can, through our awareness, that's the Dharma part in Astro Dharma. We can help tone them down if, if they're on overdrive, or we can help bring them out if, if they're operating too subtly or are repressed and so on. So Gemini refers to the twins. The twins, that's a Greek legend about Castor and Pollux. And interestingly, they, they were twins, but they had two different fathers. One of their fathers was mortal. One of their fathers was immortal. So one of the twins was immortal, one of the twins was mortal. The mortal one was killed, and the immortal one asked to share his immortality with the mortal one. But the trick was they could only be immortal one at a time, and they would trade. And Gemini, this is an important story. Stories are easier to remember sometimes because Gemini has this nature of black and white switching back and forth. And in psychology terms, that means there's a tendency to polarize, to see things in black and white. That's a, that's a pitfall for people with a strong Gemini. And we often, black and white, we often can manifest, if we have a strong Gemini, we, we are in the area of our life where Gemini is in our chart, that is where we can be most prone to doing this. It's also where we might project it onto another person and they become our bete noir or our nemesis. So if you have an other in your life, then take a look at your chart and see what you have happening in, in Gemini in the third house. And that may give you clues on how to unravel that relationship because it's no fun to have a bete noir in our lives. And uh, it's not fair to project that onto somebody else. Not so nice. Um, but Gemini generally is a very friendly and sociable sign. These are considered the social butterflies of the zodiac. The parts of the body ruled by Gemini, oh, we're in Gemini now, it's from May 21st to June 20th. Um, roughly it changes, it may change a little bit year to year. But Gemini rules the hands, the arms, and the lungs. So, the lungs. So this is another way to use astrology and astro dharma as a diagnostic is if we have health conditions or medical conditions we we can see what's happening with the sign that rules that part of the body so gemini's are known for um, communicating and for communicating with our hands and so if you know people who do this that, that may be a clue that they have something in happening in gemini Geminis love to collect little bits of information. They're fun to, they're fun conversationalists and they're fun to have at parties because they know lots of little fascinating things. And then they go from one to another, to another, to another, which indicates their love of variety, of diversity, and can also drive people a little bit crazy. This is uh, one of the challenges with Gemini is uh, we can come across as being kind of superficial or flaky because we just keep going from one thing to another, to another, to another. Closure is not Gemini's strong point. So if you're strong with Gemini, it's important to bring in some of the other signs, for example, Taurus, which is really good at finishing things. Gemini is super strong with language and communications. So these 
kinds of clues, give us clues also for uh, vocations in our lives or skills to develop. Yes, my, my fabulous video jockey, Ava. I have a question from Mr. Richard Nathaniel. Hello, Richard Nathaniel. He says, hi, Catherine. Hi, Richard. I understand that Gemini and Libra are social signs. So in what ways are they different in terms of their interactions with other people? Oh, that's a great question, Richard. And if you'd like a really wonderful shortcut to the main qualities of all the signs, houses and planets, we have a fabulous <clears throat> Astro Dharma reference guide, <clears throat> which you can download for free on Planet Dharma. <clears throat> that's one word, Dharma is D-H-A-R-M-A, planetdharma.com slash astrodharma. And uh, my amazing team finally made the Astro Dharma reference guide that I always wished that I had had, and that's available to you there at planetdharma.com slash astrodharma. So that's a great question, Richard. Yes, Gemini and Libra are both social signs. So Gemini is more about collecting information and adaptability and moving on to the next thing. So it's the true conversationalist and um, kind of the life of the party that way, but they may talk to this person and this person and this person and this person because those are all going to be different conversations and therefore interesting to someone with a strong Gemini. Libra is also very social, but Libra is more the natural diplomat. So Libra is going to be much more interested in how that other person is feeling and having a connection with that person and less likely to just go from one to another to another to another. They, they may do that, but they'll be really tuning in to how each person is feeling. Gemini is more tuning into, are we having a fun conversation? Are we exchanging ideas? Gemini is ruled by the planet Mercury. Every sign is ruled by a planet or a celestial body. And Mercury has wings on his feet, and Mercury is the messenger of the gods. So it's about where we have Mercury in our charts tells us what kind of message are we conveying in this life? What do we like to communicate about? And uh, where do we have that ability to carry ideas? That's Mercury, wings on his feet, fast. Gemini is also known to be fast. Ge Gemini is the chatterbox of the zodiac, and it can be challenging to keep up with the, the rapid fire of ideas and words that Gemini Mercury's quicksilvered tongue um, really possess that talent. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I have a question. So. Uh, Myself and other people who are in their early 30s would share Chiron in Gemini. And can you talk about sort of how that, how that may show up and how to work with that? Yeah, that's a great question. Okay. And uh, Richard, thank you for the question. Feel free to follow up in the chat if you like. Um, Chiron in Gemini. Okay, so Chiron is an asteroid. And Chiron in Greek myth was a centaur who was a mortal, got a mortal wound <clears throat> by an arrow dipped in the blood of the hydra. So would have killed anything else, you know, would have killed an elephant, but uh, because he was a mortal, he couldn't die. And it was an accidental wound. It wasn't on purpose. So this is kind of the theme of Chiron, is that there's just a wound with Chiron, and it's kind of not anybody's fault, right? So we can't attribute it to something in our upbringing, for example, or our family. And because Chiron couldn't die but had this wound that wouldn't go away, he became a great healer. He just tried everything and, and developed this amazing body of knowledge and experience and then shared that with others. So that's how Chiron is in our charts, is it's a source of pain that we can't really cure but through our efforts to assuage the pain, then we become tremendous healers that we can, and we can offer that to others. And, and you say it's generational Chiron in Gemini? 
for you? Yeah, Chiron and Gemini. So some of the outer planets or asteroids, including Chiron, they move slowly, so they affect entire generations, and that's what Ava's referring to. So everybody her age will have Chiron in Gemini, early 30s. Mm -hmm. And so the house, this is where houses get important. So the house that it's in will indicate what part of your individual life that this shows up for you in. And, and that can be very different. It can be um, in career, or it can be in relationships, or it can be in vocation, or it can be in creativity, for example. Um, however, Chiron in, in Gemini, I wonder, the first thing that comes to mind for me is that youth today uh, are inheriting so many global challenges that aren't their doing. It's not really anybody's fault. Nobody set out to mess with the planet's climate. And it's such a part of our daily lives that it's very challenging to communicate about. There's a kind of, um, the young woman Greta from Scandinavia is an excellent example of this where we want to be ringing the fire bell, but it's hard to ring the fire bell 24-7, 365, because people stop hearing it, right? So that's what comes to mind for me with Chiron in, in Gemini, is there are important things that we really need to communicate about, climate change being one of them, but, but many others. Institutionalized racism would, would be another one that comes to mind. And how do we talk about them with some urgency and also meaningfully and not just talk too. So, so in, in ways that are actually engaging and, and not just um, talking that people then start to tune out. I'd, I'd love to hear other people's ideas too if, if you relate to Chiron and Gemini and have thought about how that shows up in your life. We have a question from Mr. Andy Rogers. Monsieur Roger, bonjour. He says, hi, Catherine, looking very sharp today. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so Andy has Gemini in the 12th house, mm -hmm. third house in Leo with no planets, Mercury also in Leo. Seems like communication is strong in this chart and also comes with some challenges, question mark. So I, the question is, yeah, is it? The challenges, yeah. okay. Um, Yes, I agree with you. Communication, strong. If, if you have Mercury in, in Leo, uh, Leo has this amazing ta-da kind of energy. So Mercury is the communicating planet. So, so part of someone who has that placement, especially in the third house, which is about communications, they're going to want to communicate in this ta-da kind of way because that's what Leo loves to do. And then Gemini in the 12th house, so the... Twelfth house is super interesting house. It represents a number of things. It represents our nine months in our mother's womb. There's that oceanic connection with our mother and our <clears throat> so many things that are embedded in our organism, but but before we had awareness, so we we aren't very conscious about it. And that's the twelfth house for you. Is a, a lot of things that we're not very conscious about. And then through things like meditation, which is a 12th house activity, um, meditation and other inner work, um, therapy, for example, that's a little bit more 8th house, um, then we bring those things to awareness. So there's something about there, what Andy described, Mercury in the 3rd house in Leo would be a really strong drive to communicate, but then having... Gemini in the 12th house would have it be kind of buried in the unconscious, and it would need to be very actively brought out. Uh, we'll cover this more when we get to the 12th house, but um, whatever we have happening in the 12th house really requires a lot of conscious effort to bring it to the surface and into our lives. So uh, I don't know, Andy, if you feel... If that feels like a familiar dynamic for you, that kind of drive to communicate in a Leo kind of way, and at the same time, uh, maybe a almost kind of hiding. Uh, what we have in the 12th house is kind of hidden, sort of hidden urge to communicate. 
So if, if you're so inclined, let us know in the chat how that resonates for you. Thanks for the question. Thanks for joining us. Next up, we have a question from Zoe. Hey, Zoe. Uh, so Zoe said that you mentioned the challenges of polarization um, for Gemini. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's something that she feels very aware of right now. Can you say more about that, please? Yes, so whatever we have, like, so, so if we have strong Gemini, so Gemini is associated with the third house as well, and third house is our early upbringing, so our early childhood, and after we start becoming aware of ourselves as a being distinct from our mothers, then we notice that there are other beings around too, other things and beings around too. Those are usually our siblings. So often there may have been this kind of polarity with our siblings in our early childhood, and then we often reenact this as, as we grow older with other people. So the relationships with our siblings is a really good thing to look at with Gemini. Um, did nor This is completely normal, but usually we carry one kind of energy and our siblings carry a different kind of energy and another, if you have more siblings, they carry a different kind of energy because that's kind of the space that's available in the family household. So we look at what kind of energy did I carry? What kind of energy did they carry? And, and did we sort of export those functions or outsource those functions to one another growing up? And can we take those back? And so we would or export both positive and negative qualities. And so we can take those back and develop uh, undeveloped skills and talents and also uh, take responsibility for our own whatever. If, if somebody else was kind of the wild, irresponsible child, maybe we have a wildness in us that, that is really yearning to be expressed that uh, we have never expressed because we were the responsible one, for example. Um, it's a really good idea to do that because uh, if we don't, then we'll get together with you know, a, a wild best friend or a wild partner later in our life and, and that will we'll still be outsourcing that function and that'll bring a lot of challenges with it. So a really fun exercise to do and uh, it really is kind of fun. If you have somebody who you're in that sort of polarized relationship with, we can be them for a day. We don't need to tell them, but if you're close enough with them that you can, that, that can be interesting too, but just really try to get inside their skin for a day and, and act like them, see if you can feel like them, do what they do, try to put yourself in their frame of mind. That can really yield incredible insights and, and help us own that energy more in ourselves and be more compassionate for them and break that pattern of polarization and, and outsourcing that we tend to do. What's interesting too is we're really the only ones that we can change. Seven billion people, there's only one we can change. And uh, so if you act really differently, that will completely, it, that has to break the pattern. And so the other person will be kind of required to act differently too. And it brings a real freshness to the situation when we do that. If we act really out of our usual pattern, you can kind of see other people are like, oh my gosh, it's a whole new world. And uh, there's a lot of possibility in that moment because we can create, we're, we're the creators of our own lives. So that can be really exciting for everybody. It's a fun thing to do. Uh, thanks for the question. It is a strong theme for Geminis, and if you have a follow-up question, you're welcome to post it in the chat. Uh, Andy says thank you for your answer, and that he feels he has foot on the brakes and the accelerator at the same time. Oh, that's well described, Andy. Yeah. So a strong drive to communicate and also a, a kind of sense of it being buried at the other time. Well, go for the, go for the gas. <laughs> And this is, that's a great point, Andy. This is where it's helpful to bring out the energies in other parts of our chart. So what comes to mind for me is like, oh, draw on Aries and Mars to help get the gas going. 
And so this is the whole objective with astrodharma is we have all 12 signs, we have all the planets, we have all 12 houses, and we want to have access to all of those, and we want to be balanced in the middle of our zodiac and of our horoscope. And they say that the horoscope is a soul map. So it indicates our, our potential path for this lifetime, potential strengths and pitfalls, and so we get right in the middle, and it's all in a beautiful balance. And life is good. So Mercury, the planet Mercury rules the mind. And in the third house, it's our early childhood, that's when we start. In the second house, we kind of explored the body, this thing called me. And third house, we start realizing that we have our body and we have our mind. So there's the physical and there's the intellectual. So all of these, the Gemini, the third house, and Mercury pertain to the mind. What's, what kind of mind do we have? And how do we relate to knowledge? So some people just love new knowledge, and some people would rather go lay by the pool, right? And, and uh, it's just helpful to know which we are. And then if, for example, uh, we need our mind, <laughs> if we need to be more intellectual in a situation, then we can look at our chart for clues to where our relationship, how our relationship with the mind and knowledge is going to thrive, where it's going to excite us. Whew. Yes, Ava. Uh, so we have a couple questions here. Uh, first off, uh, Kara says, um, thank you for this live stream. You're welcome. Could you please give me some tips for North Node in Gemini in the second house? I also have Mercury and Pisces in the 10th. I do find communication somewhat challenging. My hands do tend to feel like clubbed feet, though. Your hands feel like clubbed feet. <laughs> well, that's a good insight, Karin, because I have Gemini Ascendant, sometimes called Gemini Rising. And when I first read that or learned that Gemini liked to communicate with the hands, I didn't have any that didn't resonate for me. So I just started paying attention to my hands and, oh, I guess I do talk with my hands a bit and started exploring that. So that may be something, an interesting exploration for you. If they feel like club feet, and this is a great example, um, we, we can identify a challenge and then we can work with it. We can just sort of, you know, just practice talking like this and, and see what it feels like and uh, see what kinds of feelings come up for us or ideas come up for us when when we do that and that can yield great insights okay mercury and pisces in the 10th she said yeah. okay so mercury is how we communicate information mercury could go anywhere so we really um, it's where our mind goes to a lot of different places is, is where we have Mercury. You have it in the 10th, which is the house of career. So communication is probably going to be a very important tool in your career. And so that could be, um, that could be a really active website. Oh, she makes websites um, through writing, blogs, articles, books, um, email newsletters. It could also be teaching, another form of communication, speaking to patients, that kind of counseling. Then, but Pisces is like an ocean. The energy of Pisces is oceanic. So there's gonna be a challenge there of, oh my gosh, there's so much to communicate. How do you ever communicate it all? And it will get kind of lost in the, feel a little bit adrift in the Piscean Sea. So that's just something to be aware of. Gemini is much more about pieces of information that then we can kind of put together like a puzzle. So you want to look to where you have Gemini. Did she say North Node and Gemini in the second? North Node, Gemini, yes, correct. Okay, so, so where we have our North Node is, is not a natural place for us. We are born into our South Node and the North Node feels quite foreign and it's something that we really need to actively cultivate in our lives. So, so I think 
you would do well to do this, just kind of play with organizing pieces of information. So if you feel kind of lost at sea in that Piscean way, you know, write down a bunch of things on slips of paper and, and lay them out and, and draw lines between them or, or do this all on a whiteboard, you know, see how these ideas fit together. And that will be one way to cultivate your North Node as a resource, second house, and also help you get out of that feeling of drowning in Pisces. That can happen. And then in Pisces Ultimate, once we learn to swim well, <laughs> then uh, Pisces Ultimate manifestation is this uh, bliss union with everyone and everything. So, so that's what's waiting. Um, it just takes a while to learn how to swim well with Pisces. question from Martin. Hello, Martin. So uh, he says, thanks for this event. You're welcome. Uh, so Martin says, I have Chiron conjunct North Node in Leo in the third house. Chiron conjunct North Node in Leo in the third. Okay. And also Saturn and Uranus conjunct in Gemini with major aspects to most of my other planets. So he says, my Father and brother were were and are Gemini's. In other words, I've been around that energy all of my life. Saturn and Uranus have been a challenge to navigate. I've often felt either on a roll or moving through molasses. Okay. Yes. Yes. Is, what is the question, Martin? That's a great, um, actually kind of illustrating the point. There's a lot of really great information there, but there's not a question. So you're talking about the kind of, it's either going or it's not going. So, and, and in your, your, what you shared, it's built into that. A lot of information, but no question. So something to, th that's one way of, of working with it. You know, what am I trying to communicate? Am I communicating a, sh a sharing or a question? And then just make sure you fulfill that objective that you've set for yourself. In the meantime, we have a, we have a question. In the meantime, from, okay. Uh, from well, feel, free to, feel free to come back on that, Martin. It, um, I, I don't want to leave you hanging, but I'm not sure what the question is. Uh, so Dave says, my chart has Hi, Jupiter Dave. in Gemini. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, Dave's here. Uh, he has Jupiter in Gemini in the ninth house, with Ooh. third house predominantly Sagittarius. Ooh. I have a sense of benefits and drawbacks here, but I'm not always skillful with where I expand or explore with communication. <laughs> what does a healthy, balanced manifestation of these placements look like? Okay. Okay, great. Well, thanks everybody for the questions. This is just what this live Facebook live stream is for. So I hope, uh, thank you for role modeling and I hope this helps other people be more comfortable asking questions about um, their own charts or what's coming up for them in their lives. So Gemini, uh, Dave, you nailed it. So um, Jupiter rules Sagittarius and is associated with the ninth house and you have all of those related to communications, it sounds like. and. So <clears throat> those energies are very expansive and very always moving, always exploring. So as you said, there's going to be a tendency with communication to communicate big, communicate philosophy, which is Sagittarian. So more kind of abstract ideas. And depending on what else is going on in your chart, somebody uh, you're communicating with might say like, yeah, but Dave, where are the keys? <laughs> you know, there's going to be really specific practical forms of communication or, or, you know, what about our relationship? I don't want to talk about the nature of relationships in general. I want to talk about your and my relationship. So that's the challenge with Sagittarius Jupiter in the ninth is it's always going big and philosophical and can kind of leave the personal and the practical behind. So, um, Personal and practical would be more Libra, as, as Richard pointed to in the beginning. You know, how is the other person, how am I relating to the other person? Um, seventh house is one-on-one -on -one relationships. And then practical is, is Saturn and Capricorn. So you want to use those other planets to help 
ground the, that Sagittarian energy. And um, Sag and Jupiter and Ninth, those are amazing energies. Um, so there's no inherent problem with them. It's just about getting the balance between all the energies in our, in our horoscope and not letting... Uh, it typically what happens is, according to our conditioning and our predilections, certain ones dominate how we manifest in the world. And, you know, when you're kids, it doesn't matter so much. But as we get older, um, the ones that are dominant, ones dominant, get dominant and the other ones sort of atrophy. And so then we get out of balance. So we want to use the signs with one another to get that balance. Oh, do I have South Node in Libra? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> yes. Uh, so we are at time, so this will be our last question. Okay. Uh, Martin has replied that um, how to navigate Saturn and Uranus in the 12th house. Oh, Saturn and Uranus in the 12th house, that's such a great question. In, in which sign was that, did you, was it in Gemini? Uh, conjunct, yeah, Saturn and Uranus conjunct Gemini. In Gemini, in the 12th, okay. Wow, okay. So that's a great question. So Saturn and Gemini are two of those um, somewhat slower moving planets. So everyone Martin's age will have Saturn and Uranus conjunct in Gemini. So that's a generational thing. Um, and, but in the 12th house means we, we touched on this, that's gonna be somewhat unconscious and then through a lot of meditation and therapy work, which Martin has done a lot of, then that will become more conscious. So I think the main thing is those, out, the outer planets are heavy duty. And so they just need to be handled with a bit of lightness and care because we can express them, we can get comfortable ourselves with those big energy, but maybe, especially if it's in the 12th house, be, because there's always that sort of element of, of the spectrum of consciousness and awareness involved with the 12th house, it can land really heavy for other people. So Saturn in particular can be kind of like a bludgeon and um, in, its, in its more challenging moments. And Uranus can be kind of like fireworks or, or um, a bazooka. Right, and it's, and it's more challenging moments. And they both have upsides. You know, Saturn is great with, with structure and leadership and um, foundational strength. And Uranus is really good with like, we need to get things moving, we need change, this sort of embracing new things. Um, and so we just need to take care to know which we're doing when. There's a place for the bazooka and for the bludgeon, but we want to be very judicious with, with how we manifest those energies. And it's probably most skillful, especially with communications, to, to err on the side of um, exciting new ideas with, with, um, and, and fresh approaches to change with Uranus and uh, support with Saturn. So I hope that gives you a little something to go on. Um, light, Gemini is light, and those two planets are heavy. So, so finding that balance between helping make those heavier planets light would, would be an interesting exploration. Thanks for the question. Um, gosh, thanks everybody, it's been fun. I really appreciate everyone bringing your own individual charts and questions here. Uh, please join us next month when we'll look at beloved cancer. And uh, please do check out planetdharma.com slash astrodharma for our truly fabulous astrodharma reference guide and more information on our truly fabulous introduction to astrodharma online course, which is designed to help share all these ideas that we are communicating about it being Gemini and all. Okay, may all our efforts benefit all beings and wishing you a most wonderful day. <laughs>